This program is brought to you by Pussy Magnets. Put a binge on your friend with a Pussy Magnet. Welcome, welcome, my lovely lumps. Or should I say lovely labs? I'm so thrilled to have you here in the Labia Lounge to yarn about all things sexuality, womanhood, holistic health, and everything in between. Your legs. <laughs> Ah, can never help myself. Anyway, we're going to have vag loads of real chats with real people about real shit. So buckle up, you're about to receive the sex ed that you never had and have a bloody good laugh while you're at it. Before we get stuck in, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm recording this, the Manang people. It's an absolute privilege to be living and creating dope podcast content on Noongar country, and I pay respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. Now, if you're all ready, let's flap and do this. <laughs> oh God, is there such thing as too many vagina jokes in the one intro? <laughs> Whatever, I'm leaving it in. It's my podcast. Don't panic, you're not broken. Your sex education was a piece of shit. Get your flaps out and pull the couch. It's the Lavia Lounge. Hey, my lovely lads. Welcome back. I've got some hot tips on movement and pelvic floor health around pregnancy and birth. Um, we're going to chat a little bit about before, during, and after birth for you today because I've got a really special osteo with me who's generously agreed to let me pick her brains. A big welcome to Angela, the founder of The A-Life, who's an osteo and movement coach who, along with her husband, Marty, teaches a worldwide community of movers how to move sustainably and gain new movement skills at any age. And Ange recently gave birth to her first baby girl, um, who I just got to meet on on video, all milk drunk from a big feed. Um, and after going really deep into research on how movement can help labor and recovery, she recently launched her newest online program, Move and Mamas, to help mums specifically train their bodies for childbirth. So this is an exciting topic. I don't have kids, but I fucking love this shit and I want to have kids one day. So I'm constantly collecting little bits of information. So I'm really stoked to have you here, Ange. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to chat about this topic too. <laughs> cool. So we like just to give everyone um, some context, we were just chatting more sort of like, okay, so Ange was saying, look, I'm not a specific pelvic floor osteo, but I am an osteo. I'm obsessed with movement. I did heaps of my own research and then went through my own birth journey. But I just want to make sure everyone knows that what we're sharing here is, you know, it's Angela's personal experience. And if there's something that you're like, oh, that didn't work for me or that didn't go down that way in my birth or pregnancy, don't don't feel bad. Don't feel like we're saying that that's wrong. There's no kind of like one way. Um, and what we'll be sharing is, yeah, a bit, a bit research based and then also a bit of, of like personal experience. Is that right? Yeah, totally. I, I think that's, that's one thing. Everyone has a different, um, goal or thing they want to work towards, or some people have none mm. and just want to go with the flow. Everyone's very different when they approach birth. And for me, this was, one of my, I had my specific thing that I really wanted to work towards and I just researched and did everything I could to get there. And now that I'm on the other side, I just like feel like I just want to shout from the rooftops that, you know, <laughs> if you want it, it's possible. Of course, we can't control everything when it comes to anything in life, but we can definitely improve our chances and do, and so that we, feel empowered when we leave the birth mm. portal and that's really what I mm. want for every woman. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I think like something to be aware of which any mum will know or like woman in general, people really love having an opinion on how you birth, what you do in pregnancy, how you parent. Like there's a lot of criticism and judgment and just people putting their two cents in around motherhood. Um, and I've seen this, I've heard, you know, mums complain like far out. It's almost like as soon as someone knows you're trying for a baby or they see the baby bump, they just go, oh, that's free game to just start talking at me and being like, oh, well, you need to do this and you have to do this. And oh, what do you mean? You, you know, like even I've noticed among different friends who are starting to get pregnant, like, um, yeah, the the judgment and the opinions that start getting thrown around and 
are you kidding me? You're not getting an ultrasound. That's irresponsible. You shouldn't be allowed to be pregnant. You know, there's so much judgment and it's such a personal thing. So very like wary of, um, of sort of that as well, because mums in particular really cop a lot of unsolicited advice and opinions. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. I experienced this, like if you haven't ever experienced, figured out boundaries before getting pregnant, you are going to need them and figure out how Mm. that's going to work for you and find your voice for your boundaries. Like for me, I really wanted a home birth and even just saying that out aloud to, I was Mm. very picky on who I shared that with. And even of course, my family were one that I shared with and I, we did come up against like everyone else's fears about how you want to mm-hmm. birth. And so not mm-hmm. only you're dealing with your own because, you know, we, mm-hmm. everything about birth is unknown, but then people are dumping their fears <laughs> onto yeah. you as well. And you have to kind of put up your guard and really um, protect your space. And because yeah. we're going to talk about it, that, you know, it's a very physical thing giving birth but it's also Mm -hmm. your mental state and your spiritual Mm -hmm. state is also so important when it comes to um, birth that you need to have those things in place to protect um, to protect Mm -hmm. yourself and you know keep your space safe as well and yeah Mm -hmm. I just found just people were dumping a lot of advice and you know and in my research I would actually then go and be like that was completely wrong what that person told me. I'm like, I'm yeah. so glad that I looked it up because like the, the there's so much new research as well when it comes to, um, you know, what, how, what things affect your birth. And there's just, I hate the word misinformation, but there is just so yeah. much of people just blurting out the completely wrong thing that's just based on fears and not actually true. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. All right. So with all that said, let's start chatting a bit about movement throughout pregnancy. And I kind of thought maybe we could um, work our way towards, you know, from pregnancy towards covering postnatal tips and stuff last. So what sort of movement is actually healthy and safe during pregnancy because I I don't know loads about this but I have heard you know probably a bunch of misinformation or different opinions but you know I've heard there's certain things like um actually this one actually I think is true because we learned about this in my yoni mapping training but really deep stretching you know should be avoided if you're heavily pregnant because of higher levels of elastin and and it can be a bit dangerous and you know maybe there's new research about that now um and then of course there's a lot of people that are probably really nervous to do anything that's I don't know too high impact or potentially might be bad for the pregnancy so are there some general rules of thumb that are helpful to know about when it comes to approaching movement during pregnancy? Yeah, such a good question because this is what everyone focuses on first when it comes to moving Mm -hmm. in pregnancy, like what I can't, what can I not do anymore? And Mm -hmm. I think that itself brings up so much fear um, and Mm. uh, then the woman ends up getting really scared of moving. And the thing is like, especially if you've got other kids, you're lifting other kids, you're get doing things anyway Mm -hmm. and then when you go to exercise you're kind of frozen of like this very limited set of things you can do I really um don't love black and white rules because I just don't think it's practical because it's just so many nuances of like what are you doing beforehand do you have any pain or injuries already in your body that you have to consider um and that that kind of thing is really relevant to just as opposed to just taking a black and white rule of you can do this can't do this and I even found when I fell pregnant and went to look at what exercise was available for pregnancy um, it was a lot of just your average exercises but then with the pregnancy modifications so don't lie on your belly Mm. don't do an ab crunch um, you know that kind of thing and or do very gentle yoga and I was just like you know, I feel like so we're capable of so much more, especially in like your first and second trimester. Um, of course, as you as you go progress through your third trimester, things are going to start to wind down because obviously physically you've got a huge belly, but um, there is still so much you can do. But that's okay. Let's focus on. So generally, the things that you can't do, I guess, is first what, and I found this on myself as well because 
I was quite active beforehand. So I was doing a lot of, um, yeah, I guess more advanced kind of exercises and things like that. And what you'll find with pregnancy is to want to tend to avoid more core intensive exercises. So this, okay. this in itself is very variable because it depends on what state you're in when you, when you go into your pregnancy. But if things like, like, for example, I was doing pull-ups or, um, stronger exercises like that. And you'll find that when you're doing more core intensive exercises, your abdominal pressure increases. And you may have mm-hmm. heard of like your rectus abdominis and um, mm-hmm. that linear alba. So you can, as you, your baby gets bigger, those, those muscles have to split apart to accommodate for your yeah. growing baby, which is normal. It's completely normal. If you take your pregnancy full term, you're going to get that opening in the in the front of the abdomen to make space for your baby but at the same time if you're doing too much core intensive exercises you can get a thing called coning which is where Mm. basically the abdominals kind of poke out the front and it kind of creates a little point at the front of your Mm. tummy now that's not great because we want to avoid that as much as possible because it's going to weaken that abdominal wall and then we're going to find postpartum that recovery is going to be a lot harder and Mm -hmm. so you don't just have to think about pull-ups for example it can be something as simple as getting up from your bed when you're pregnant it's a lot easier a lot better for your belly to lie onto your side and push yourself up as opposed to kind of doing that abdominal crunch forward that's going to Mm. increase the pressure in the abs and cause that coning at the front of the abdomen but um yeah it does depend on your current strength because someone who does a pull-up that finds it really hard is gonna have coning much earlier on than the person who does crossfit every day and is really strong so that does come with its nuances too but generally core intensive exercises we doesn't mean we don't use our core but we want to be aware of that abdominal pressure Mm -hmm. um The second, I guess, is a high impact exercise. I mean, if you're a runner and you've been running your whole life, I'm not really going to tell you to stop running um, during a pregnancy because you're probably not going to do it anyway. But you do (laughs) want to be aware um, that as you go on, you know, um, high intensity, high impact exercises has to start to decrease just to protect your pelvis and your belly and as you were saying with that relaxin hormone I mean it's nothing to be afraid of relaxin hormone is like this amazing hormone that we get when we're pregnant to help like our pelvis move our our whole pelvis is movable it's why it's got all these joints there to accommodate to open for our baby to descend through but at the same time relaxin is going to mean more joint mobility So if you are already a really kind of lax, mobile person, it is something that you've got to be aware of. But it doesn't mean that um, you can't, you should avoid movement. It basically just means if you start early and start strengthening those areas, start strengthening the muscles that cross the joints, which is a lot of the stuff I work with, um, then you're able to still maintain that stability as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's right, relaxin. I think I called it elastin. Relaxin. <laughs> relaxin. <laughs> it makes you more elastic. Yeah. Um, but, so that birth's easier, right? But then you can hyperextend your joints and things like that. Yeah. And I mean, look, a lot of the time when you look at the options for pregnancy, a lot of the time it is just yoga. It's like do yoga mm-hmm. for pregnancy. Mm-hmm. But if you already have un- insta- unstable joints and then you're mm-hmm. just stretching them, that's probably not going to help you too much. We're better off stabilizing and strengthening our joints mm. during our pregnancy, which is where strength work comes into it and resistance mm. training, which I think is should not be avoided in pregnancy. Yeah. Okay. So then in terms of what you should be doing more of, it sounds like through your you know, research, it was all pretty basic, pretty general, maybe with the pregnancy modifications, which isn't super specialized. And sounds like with your Move and Mamas course, you've kind of gone really deep into very specific um, specialized movement for bodies that are preparing for childbirth. What kinds of movement should we be doing and what sort of movement are you teaching people to start doing? Yeah. Okay. So this is what I love talking about because this is giving us like things to do. Um, so 
in general, before we even start talking about exercise, um, walking is amazing mm-hmm. because it's a we're, we're moving our pelvis, we're creating stability in our pelvis, we're accommodating for the growing baby as well. So if you're just sitting at a desk all day and you're leaning your back against a chair all day, your glutes are relaxed and you're doing that through your whole pregnancy, we're not giving our body a chance to strengthen and adapt to the growing baby. So as our baby grows, it's a mass that's kind of at the front, if you think about it, and it's going to be pulling us forward. So we need to increase our strength, especially in our back body, in our posterior Mm. chain. And so I always tell mums who are working to sit on the edges of their chair at times, at nighttime, instead of moving from your desk to your couch, sit onto the floor up on a cushion so that your hips can adapt to the changes Mm -hmm. and that are happening through your pregnancy. So I really love walking for that because it's active, it's easy, anyone can do it, it's weight-bearing as well. Um, And then when it comes to, we were talking, started talking about resistance training, so creating strength. As I was saying with the belly growing at the front, we want to increase our strength in the posterior chain. So things like our glutes, our hamstrings, our back body to help strengthen those areas so that we don't end up coming into this huge anterior tilt where you see those mums where the belly is kind of hanging forward and their back is kind of going into that big amount of extension. So we're able to counter that and kind of create that better uh, postural plumb line, I guess, or like center of gravity in our body um, to help keep us in neutral through our pregnancy. And that's really doable as long as you sort of start at the beginning of your pregnancy in that trimester one where the changes are minimal and you help your body Mm, adapt mm. through those trimesters as well. Um, And I do want to say as well, I mean, in trimester one, it's very different for everyone. It can be really up and down. Energy can be low. We can be feeling sick and nauseous and Mm. that kind of thing. And I just say like on the days you have the energy, that's the days to move your body. But if you can't move through trimester one just because you feel sick, it is important to prioritize sleep and nutrition over exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's always time in at when you start to kind of feel better in that trimester too as well. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, so definitely strengthening the posterior chain. The second thing I would say is uh, we want abdominal support. So as I was saying with the growing belly, we can get that pendulous belly where the belly kind of hangs over if we're not using our core to help support the growing belly. So doing core exercises is definitely important and doing it in a dynamic way and also using learning to utilize our core when we're just doing our everyday things, when you're picking up your washing basket, when you're picking up your other child, when you're moving from one place to another, starting to remember to engage your core as well. Um, mm. the third, so with, yeah, the, with the core, yeah. so, cause we want to be careful of the rectus abdominis separating and getting the coning. Um, and people might've seen that. I remember learning about that. They might've seen, you know, you almost get a darkening color stripe down the front of the belly from the belly button down. That's where it starts separating. Is that right? Yeah. So it's big in the middle of the belly. I mean, we don't normally get that separation until sort of the, towards the end of the pregnancy Um, but yeah you do want to be able to manage pressure so with that core work it is important that we also learn how to breathe because Mm -hmm. if you think about your breathing that's how we manage the pressure in our abdomen Mm -hmm. as well Mm -hmm. so I normally teach sort of like a candle's breath so it's a 3d diaphragm inhale when you're breathing through the front the side and the back of the ribs And then as you exhale, it's like you're blowing out 30 candles on a birthday cake. So you blow out through (laughs) your mouth and fully exhale. And you'll find that if you fully exhale all the way to the very end, your core will naturally contract. You're not kind of bracing or bearing down. Mm -hmm. When I'm in core, it's not that kind of bracing, bearing down pressure in the belly. That's what we want to avoid. Like we're talking about the pressure. It's all about managing the pressure. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So it's still good to, to kind of engage your core and try to get that 
get that all happening, but not in a way that's going to bear down on the pelvic floor and create exactly. pressure and then potentially separation. So I guess just like, yeah, not all core exercises are equal and they're good for different things. So I suppose yeah. that's why you'd want to do the Move and Mamas course because it's like, you know, really specific to like your needs when you're pregnant and I guess different um, stages of the pregnancy, like in the beginning you could get away with a lot more, whereas when you're really fucking pregnant, like, yeah, you got to be super careful because there's so much um, pressure and gravitational kind of uh, downward sort of pressure on your pelvic floor um, that, yeah, you don't want to be like stretching everything out too much. Yeah, and it needs to be whole body. Like that's the thing. I think when mm. just got to realize when one part of us is not moving well, the pressure or the uh, is going to go somewhere else. So mm. another thing that I really recommend is like upper back, rib, and upper body mobility through your pregnancy because mm. if this area is not moving well, you got to think all our organs are getting pushed up upwards mm -hmm. towards our diaphragm our ribs need to act our whole rib cage needs to move as mm. well that it's important that we're keeping the upper back keeping the ribs mobile keeping the shoulders mobile as well so mm. that by keeping that mobile we're putting less pressure on our lower back on our pelvis mm. and things like that so you'll probably yeah. find as you go obviously it's a little bit twisting and side bending things like that gets a little bit harder um, but it is important that we maintain as much mobility throughout our whole pregnancy through that area to help with the other areas as well. Yeah, because it's, you know, on one hand you're wanting to throughout the pregnancy be strengthening and and kind of preparing your body to be carrying a heavier and heavier load and have your center of gravity being pulled forward and then you're also wanting to prepare yourself for the act of labor and giving birth and then you know make the recovery easier so I guess there's so many different elements that yeah. you're trying to kind of you know approach holistically so I interrupted you but you were going to yeah. keep talking about other forms of no. exercise yeah no it's really important you said that because it is towards the end, of course, we actually want, you know, I've said we want to use our core to support our belly, but we also want, and I don't really like the word relax because our pelvic floor doesn't completely relax, otherwise we'd be peeing ourselves, but we want our <laughs> pelvic floor to lengthen, to be able to lengthen, to be able to like move through its full range of motion. And that's to prepare mm -hmm. us for uh, for childbirth. We want our pelvic mm -hmm. floor to have the ability to get out the way so our uterus can do its job and push our baby mm. down. So that's another thing is like a lot of us women are going into pregnancy and we've done a lot of Pilates and we've been wearing tight jeans and sucking our belly in and that overactive tight pelvic floor can actually mm. work against us when it comes to our pregnancy and labor. Um, so there's definitely things in movement that you can do to release and open and lengthen. And so our pelvic floor yields, but, um, you can also see a pelvic floor practitioner for that. Um, like a pelvic floor osteo or a physio, someone who can do internal work to release those quadrants of the pelvic Me. floor as well. <laughs> yes. So powerful. I did this through my pregnancy and, um, I really think it helped my birth 100% because yes, we can do stuff through movement, through our breath to relax our pelvic floor, to lengthen it. But, you know, there's so, it's so dynamic and there's so many areas. It's, we want it to be really balanced. So, you know, the left, our baby will always move towards where there's um, space. So if there's tension mm. on one side of our pelvis or one side of our pelvic floor, it's, it's not going to want to go there. So we want to create mm. as basically the goal is to create as much space as we can for our baby. So the, the journey is easier. So that's where mm. that pelvic floor work, that internal work can be really helpful because, mm. um, it can just help you get that little extra bit more of, um, balance in your pelvic floor and in your pelvis as well. Hey, babe towns. So sorry to interrupt, but I simply had to pop my head into the lounge here and mention another virtual lounge that you've got to get around. 
It's the Labia Lounge Facebook group that I've created for listeners of the potty to mingle in. And there you'll find extra bits and bobs like freebies or discounts for offerings from guests who've been interviewed on the podcast, inspiring and thought-provoking conversations, and support from a community of labial legends. I also have an account on the fab new app Sunroom, which is a platform created by women for women and non-binary folk, and where there's no shadow banning or censorship of sex-positive content, unlike with the other platforms that I'm on. So you can hit up my sunroom for extra content and real and raw life updates because I'll be sharing on there from now on all of the stuff that I can't post anywhere else. My vision for both of these is that they become really supportive, educational and hilarious resources for you to have more access to me and a safe space to ask questions that you can't ask anywhere else. So head over to the links in the show notes and I'll hopefully see you in there. And now back to the episode. Mm, Totally. And I guess the pelvic floor muscles, often people don't have a lot of awareness of them or connection and they're not really very uh, in touch with how to engage them or what it what it feels like to fully relax them and allow them to lengthen. And so sometimes that sort of feedback loop, loop of having internal massage is just helping their brain connect to that part of the body and go, oh, that's where that is and that's what that feels like and that's how I relax that and I can kind of get them to squeeze my finger with their pelvic floor muscles and then relax and we can see how much they're actually releasing and, you know, whether there's work to do with releasing tension and, um, I mean, hypertonic pelvic floors are just rife, aren't they? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, and so true and that uh, bringing that attention to that area sometimes we've never done it until you get Mm. to this pregnancy and you're like oh shit I need Mm -hmm. to start thinking about (laughs) what's what's happening down there where where what does it work for me can I bring my mind body connection to that area Mm. and so some people just breathing doing exercises um to like open through like the bone like between the two sit bones and thinking about creating Mm. width can be enough for some people we need to get a mirror and see what's actually happening when you contract for some Mm. people it needs to be um pelvic floor work internal work can be really really helpful so yeah that Mm. that really is a huge part because um, I think if it's missed then and you don't have that connection, it's a really hard way to um, when you're in the moment, when you're in labor, um, you know, it's a hard thing to connect to if you've never done it before. I always say even a lot of the movements that we do in our third trimester of Moving Mama, a lot of it is movements that you can do in your labor because when we practice things before, when we've done it before, mm. um, our nervous system can kind of go off guard and it can relax. And we can be like, I've done this before. I know how to breathe. I can relax my jaw. Yeah. And it's really conducive to labor. But if we wait till the very end and we've written down these these positions that we want to <laughs> use in labor, but you don't actually do it until you mm. get to that moment, you're you're going to get stressed and yeah. your um, nervous system is not going to allow and your baby's going to feel that. And so it's, things aren't yeah. going to open and unwind as well. Yeah, like just having the the familiarity and the muscle memory of those positions and, yes. and exercises would just be so helpful because it's not like you've got a whole lot of bandwidth to and like to kind of in labor be like okay so now I'm gonna do this no No, you just want to like feel as though it's almost automatic because you've already done it and I guess that's why people do you know the breath work classes to prepare and things but that sort of leads me into my next question around um, movement and exercises you can do whether that's breath work whether that's actually um, moving to prepare for birth uh, that's going to help prepare and protect your pelvic floor muscles in birth yeah so in like general, the all the things that I've already mentioned are going to help um, and I'll mention one more as well just to help with when we talk about the levels of the pelvis and when the baby goes down different ways the pelvis needs to open. But in general, the more um, mobility we can create around our pelvis and like I was talking about, the more our pelvic floor can lengthen, all those things are going to help our our labor be 
uh, less traumatic, I guess. You may mm. need to push mm-hmm. less. It may be quicker because we're able, we're going to be stronger so we can be more upright. When gravity is able to work, it's going to put more pressure down on our cervix mm-hmm. and our, our labor hopefully will be a little bit shorter. And all of that is going to allow our um, recovery to be better because our birth was less traumatic. If we have a traumatic birth, which happens, and I would say almost, I think the statistic I heard my midwife say was one in three women have a tra- have, see their birth as traumatic, which mm. I probably think is probably more than that. But yeah. the less trauma that we have in our childbirth, then our recovery is easier and our recovery is shorter and we're able to get back to doing the things that we love Mm -hmm. in a quicker amount of time. But when it does come to preparing for birth, so when we're talking about the the baby kind of descending down the pelvis, there's different levels of the pelvis that um, open and close for different movements. So the top of the pelvis um, will open with external rotation and extension. So um, that which a lot of is in a lot of programs, that sort of glute work, external rotation, wide kind of squats, things like that you can do to help open the top of the pelvis. But the problem is when the top of the pelvis opens, the bottom of the pelvis closes. So Mm -hmm. we need to be able to move our pelvis in different levels. In mid pelvis, all those sort of asymmetrical movements are really helpful. So, um, you know, one leg up, one other leg up. Um, mm. Working on a lot of the things that we do in our third trimester is working on lower body movements with rotation or uneven movements mm. as well. So those sort of movements through the pelvis are going to help open different sides through the mid pelvis. And then the bottom of the pelvis, which I think is missing in a lot of the general exercise programs, we have need to be able to access internal rotation. So, I mean, not always. I mean, if you have happen to have a big wide pelvis and a tiny baby, sure, it's fine. But most of <laughs> us who need to work a little bit more through our labor um, and have our baby move through, if we can act, if we can't access that internal rotation, um, then we're probably more likely to have a labor stall in that point. So for me, like I remember I had a bit of a labor stall when my baby was now looking back, I know, when she was sort of in that mid pelvis and I found it really helpful. I was on my stairs having one leg up and having some Mm. surges in these like uneven positions and my God, it was strong. (laughs) But as soon as I did that and I did a little sideline work with rotation with my midwife, I got back in that water and shoo, she just like flew out after that <laughs> because the baby knows where they need to go, but we need to be able to create the space for them to move. So being able to access those different movements, can, which you can work on in your pregnancy, can be really helpful when it comes to your labor. And as we're talking about, that's going to help with your recovery. The, you know, like I didn't, really push when I when um, my baby came so I experienced the fetal ejection reflex so Mm -hmm. the baby my stomach just just when she was in the right position she was ready and my uterus just bed just pressed down I didn't even Mm. do anything and so because I wasn't pushing for hours and hours and I wasn't straining and having that kind of strong pressure I didn't have that trauma to my pelvic floor to the tissues around my, um, you know, my ba- I had time to lengthen and stretch mm. the tissues around to open up and things like that. So I didn't experience any of the tearing and which I would say is totally normal too and can happen in many pregnant, many um, births. But um, mm. I just think that the, the, the more we can help our baby move through our pelvis through this, these physical things as well. And of course it's mm-hmm. mental as well, being able to mm-hmm. trust mm-hmm. that your body knows how to do it. But yeah. that is the big thing is like, we were designed to birth. Our bodies know our body grew this baby. We didn't have to say grow five fingers, five toes and all of that thing. It just did it. Then we, then we also need that trust that our body knows how to move. And, but that thing is, moving intuitively so we don't want to use our thinking brain when we're in labor but relying on just being like I'm just going to intuitively move when you've never done it before and you haven't connected Mm. with your body through your pregnancy 
it's going to make it so much harder. So part of it, even just not even the exercises, but just the fact that you're connecting with your body through your Mm -hmm. trimesters, connecting with your breath, bringing your attention down into your pelvic floor, getting to know your pelvic floor, getting to know your breath, getting to know what areas feel tight and how you feel through your pregnancy is also just such a good tool because that's going to become so useful when it comes to your labor Mm. as well. Yes. Yeah. And like I would even say potentially the most important thing is that connection. And it's like, sure, we Mm. are naturally designed and built to give birth intuitively, but we've lost touch with that so much because of the way that we live in this modern world now. And we're sitting down constantly and we barely know how to engage our pelvic floors. Like it's, it's quite interesting, I guess, through my work, how many uh, clients I, I get that just have complete numbness or disconnect and are unable to engage their pelvic floors or even know if they're engaging them or not. Um, And so I feel like the first port of call and it's, you know, obviously moving your body and breathing and stuff will naturally connect you. So it all goes hand in hand and a holistic approach is best, but I feel like that connection is so missing. And so if we are like, yeah, we're just going to like intuitively go for it. I trust my body, but we never move. We're never in our body. We're always in our heads. We're totally like disconnected from our genitals, our pelvic floor. You know, maybe there's a bit of shame. Maybe there's fear because we're, you know, there's so much fear mongering around pregnancy and birth. Um, of course, it's going to it's gonna be tricky to just tap into this intuitive. Like we almost need to rewild ourselves first mm-hmm. and like reconnect with our bodies and our primal ability to birth and to trust our body to, bodies that we have that primal ability. Um, and, yeah, yeah, you can't just totally rely on, on that just appearing if you've no. <laughs> spent most of your life disconnecting from that, you know? Totally. Yeah. I had this vision that I was like, I want a physiological unmedicated birth. But then when I actually (laughs) looked it up, like I have no examples of this. And when I remember the midwife at a hypnobirthing course I went to, she said like, when I shut your eyes, when I say the word birth, what comes to your head? Like first thing. And Mm. in my head, I visualized the movie scene where like the woman was her legs Mm -hmm. up. There was like 10 nurses around. Like, like that's what came into my head, even though I had even started listening to a lot of home birth stories and I'd started the list, reading a lot of books and putting that starting to filter my head. Mm. But it was just a real eye opener that I still had work to do because I had just been so conditioned that that's not birth. And so I had Mm -hmm. to really give myself a lot of examples. I was listening to literally birth stories every day through my pregnancy. I was visualizing going into my room of how it was going to happen and just really flooding my brain with the, you know, moving in the way I was going to move through my labor Um, and just, yeah, flooding my nervous system and my brain are trying to rewire it to this new Mm -hmm. way and trying to sort of start to remove this cultural conditioning that we've brought up, been brought up with. Because if, especially if you have no examples, it's um, around you. And a lot of time in our Western world, we don't. I think like in Victoria anyway, I don't know what it is in the other states, but less than 1% is a home birth in Victoria, which is wild. But, you know, I think about it like my grandma was home birth. She was that my mom was born at home. So when I really um, had to dig, I had to dig to be like, this is what I want. But where are the examples to help uh, confirm my nervous system that this Mm -hmm. is okay, this is safe? Mm. Totally. I know we're so lacking in in role models in that in that way. And it's this is reminding me a little bit of um, an episode I did with uh, Bernadette from Core Floor and Restore. I think yeah. I got that right. It's core, core floor, core something. Else. Um, <laughs> and it was all it was all about sort of yeah, I guess the the over pathologization of birth and the hospital system and the dangers of birthing in the hospital system and all of that. So feel free to check that out, everyone. Um, oh. But yeah, you know, she was just talking about like you were saying in the movies, you just see like. They, they're screaming at you to push and the birth just looks so different. And if you ideally have, um, you know, your body's kind of innate 
response, which is, did you call it, I can't, she talked about this as well. Was it the um, fetal ejection yeah. response? Yeah, reflex. Yeah, like you don't even need to push. Yeah, reflex. You, you, don't, you don't even need to push. It just takes over um, and it kind of does the pushing for you and it just ejects the baby. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're kind of all, you know, expecting we're going to have to bear down and push and obviously blow out our pelvic floor muscles and potentially tear because we're being encouraged to push way too early. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's just, it's just, yeah. Anyway, anyway, that's a rant. I'd love to do the segment, get pregnant and die before I drill you with some more questions. Yeah. So do you have, um, an anecdote about your sex ed that you're happy to share with us? Don't have sex because you will get pregnant and die. die. Don't have sex in the missionary position. Don't have, don't have sex standing up. Just don't do it. Promise. Yeah, um, so, oh gosh, there's so much about my sex education that was lacking. <laughs> but I think, you know, and I'll bring it back to birth. I think, you know, what it was is that I, and I revisited this when I um, was preparing for this rite of passage that I was going to go through from maiden to mother. And I really re- saw this, this, how do I want this rite of passage to feel? What do I want to, to be in my body? What kind of event do I want to acknowledge it with? And I made me think back on the other rites of passage. So, for example, um, you know, when I first got my period, it was a really um, non-event, I guess. It was something mm-hmm. that was just like, yeah, okay, this is what you do there you go, move on. And I really felt like it was kind of stolen from me. You know, it wasn't acknowledged. It wasn't, I didn't have any wise women telling, giving me yeah. some nuggets of what this means or what it can represent or what the next mm-hmm. sort of stage of life is going to look like. And I really felt like that was um, poorly executed in my in yeah. that um, part of life and I actually as part of my preparation for birth I went back and rewrote that I rewrote that rite of passage oh. and I found that was really healing for me and then I was able to now move into this rite of passage and also thinking about my daughter now how do I want mm. to acknowledge that for her what are we going to do are we going to create some sort of ceremony or I don't know if you've heard Jane Hardwick Collins but she talks yeah. about <laughs> like doing a beautiful ceremony where you have like all the women in her sort of community, her village who can share that wisdom. And for me, that's, that's what I want to bring for my daughter in, in that. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. And it's funny, as you were talking, I was like, oh my gosh, this sounds, because I interviewed Jane Hardwick Collings on oh. menopause and rites of passage. And she was talking about, you know, the different rites of passage and stages, period and motherhood, mm. menopause, they're so connected. And if you reflect on, you know, as you did, your menarch, and then you kind of, yeah, you use that to like rewrite and heal and inform the next rites of passage that you're going going through and yeah I love I love her work that's yeah that was a really beautiful episode and yeah like oh, listening to you talk listen like, to that. Oh, yeah and that could be for um men as well like if I ever have a boy yeah. I'll be like telling my husband maybe they'll go into the, the woods for a hunt or something together or yeah. I don't know <laughs> something yeah. that will be uh, meaningful for them as well which is nice totally yeah it's such a missing piece and it's so nourishing and important Thank you for that. All right, so maybe let's move towards uh, post. Well, okay. What about what about it? we're in labor? So we've done mm-hmm. sort of pre, you know, prenatal movement and preparation in labor. Like, what are the best sort of positions for the pelvic floor to be encouraging your body to give birth, or are we just following whatever your body wants to do? Because I know, I mean, surely most people know by now that whole lying on your back with your feet up in the Mm. stirrups is shocking for your body and it's just a convenient sort of position for the doctors. What positions are actually quite helpful for giving birth and protecting your pelvic floor in labour? Excuse the interruption, my loves, but I'm shamelessly seeking reviews and five-star ratings for the potty because, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, it's pretty fab. And the more people who get to hear it, the more people it can help. 
Reviews and ratings help me curry favour with the algorithmic gods and get suggested to other listeners to check out. Plus, they make me feel really good and appreciated as I continue to pour my heart and soul into creating this baby for you. And I promise I don't mazz over them or anything. I mostly just tuck them away for a rainy day when I'm filled with self-doubt and existential dread about being self-employed, which is fairly frequently. (laughs) So you see, leaving a review really does make a difference and it's an easy little act of support that you can take in just a minute or two by either going to Spotify and leaving five stars for the show or writing a written review and leaving five stars over on Apple Podcasts. Choose your poison, or if you're a real overachiever, you could do both. Whoa now. If you are writing a review, though, just be sure to only use G-rated words, because despite the fact that this is a podcast about sexuality, words like sex can be censored and your review won't actually show up. Lame. Anyway, oh, oh, what was that? Oh, you're going to go do it right now while I wait. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great idea. May as well just quickly click that five-star button before we get on with it and, you know, like forget about it and get on with your day. Um, um, oh, I'm hearing them roll in. I'm hearing those five stars. <laughs> oh my God, I make myself cringe. Anyway, uh, thank you much, Lee. You're a total gem and I'll let you get back to the episode now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, right, totally with the on your back. But this is going to look different for everyone because if you feel like you want to move into the position and even maybe that position is on your back for that moment, I really feel like that in labor you need to listen to your body and try try it out. And a lot of that comes down to making sure you've set up your right environment, that you feel comfortable, Mm -hmm. that you can go and move and change into any position and this is where it gets a little bit tricky in the hospital because you do feel like the lights are bright and everyone's watching you and so it's very hard to have that intuitive movement when you are feeling watched which you know I was grateful that I was at home and I had set up my ball and I'd set up my birth sling on the door and I had my pool there and I had a yoga mat down with some cushions so I was comfortable moving into all those positions and as I said like I had done a lot of it before in my preparation so you know in the third trimester of moving mama we've got a birth ball class and I would even just have my birth ball in the tv room in the third trimester and just kind of hang over it and just practice kind of leaning over it and just relaxing Mm. because you know a lot of the time that sort of being able to relax and relax especially even through your jaw can really affect Mm. your pelvic floor as well so that's where Mm -hmm. that finding positions where you feel most comfortable because if you're not comfortable you can't breathe properly and you're going to be tense so you know I could say Mm -hmm. for me being in a deep squat is actually a really I felt really comfortable in that position I would kind of grab onto I've got a birth sling if you haven't had a look at what a birth sling is they're amazing they're like these kind of ribbon (laughs) slings that you can hang on to the door and you can kind of just do all different kind of movements with it's really cool um and just allow you to kind of your body to kind of hang on them and so that for me was really relaxing like in my early labor I tried to be upright as much as possible like we were talking about letting gravity kind of do a lot of that initial work um all fours was really comfortable for me as well just spending and this is where um You know, in our classes, we do a lot of work on wrist work and things like that because you do, this is where the endurance does come into it because if you really enjoy, like enjoy the position of being on all fours, but then, you know, your wrists are caving or you're getting tired, this is where it can be a bit tricky. Um, I use the support of my husband as well. We did a lot of um, partner kind of movements together, which we'd practiced before as well. Um, and sort of he knew exactly what to do when I didn't have yeah. to kind of teach him in the moment. He already knew what he had to do through those surges. Mm. Um, mm. So I found that and then um, I guess also being in water. But I would definitely also check out, um, now what's it called, um, Spinning Babies has a lot of yeah. um, great free resources on their website where you can um, mm. get some different positions that can help move baby Mm. and you can try out for yourself Um, but what I would definitely recommend is practicing those before before the moment yeah 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 beautiful 
Yeah, love love the spinning baby, babies vibe. I trained with Jenny Blythe and um, I just, yeah. I, wow, it's, amazing. It's, so, it's kind of bizarre that I'm so into pregnancy yeah. and birth <laughs> and I don't, don't have any personal experience, but I guess it's really relevant to what I do and I work with a lot of mums like prenatally yes. and postnatally. So, so good. <laughs> um, it'll serve me well one day. Hey, sure. We're 100%. You'll get to put it all into practice. <laughs> um yeah I've always thought about being a doula as well I think it's just an area that, like it it, on, mm. it honestly like brings me to tears like if I even think about birth or if I watch a scene yeah. or videos on Instagram you know like I can cry straight up <laughs> yeah so huge and emotional and powerful like yeah it's funny um, that you feel that now because I honestly didn't really feel that until I went through <laughs> this bring a fire myself um and now I just I'm my, even my husband, once he learned about the history of birth and watched me go through it and watched me birth at home and see me mm. in like my raw state, roaring my baby mm. out. He like is now like the biggest advocate for home birth and he wants to like, <laughs> literally we could both talk about birth at like to anyone. <laughs> Oh, I get goosebumps. Yeah. And honestly, like I've got so many questions down and we're already running out of time. This is just such a big topic <laughs> that I just love. So, um, all right. So what about after birth? Like what sort of movement and like how should we generally be moving? Because I feel like postnatal recovery is so often just like rushed and there's all this pressure and these expectations placed on women to get their pre-baby body back and like also we often don't have the luxury of like resting nearly as much or as long as we need to so what's your what are your thoughts on recovery after you give birth yeah it's huge I mean I think if we remember that we have a wound the size of our placenta inside our body like if you oh, got wow. to if you got to see your placenta that is the wound that has to heal postnatal and I think if that wound was sitting like outside us I feel like people yeah. were, might take our postpartum recovery a little more mm-hmm. seriously um but it is big and mm. I, I personally really like um the five by five by five kind of rule which is five days mm in the bed, five days on the bed, five days around the bed. So roughly kind of Mm -hmm. two weeks spending a lot of time horizontal because our pelvic floor has just had like a huge thing go through and, you know, we need to give it some rest and it's that whole gravity and pressure and we need to limit that as much as possible for healing, especially Mm -hmm. in that first two weeks and also let that wound heal, let our body come back to balance. So I think, you know, rest in that first two weeks obviously is, one of the most important things and that's Mm -hmm. easier said than done because I think in that preparation is the key and getting support is the key so you know getting preparing your meals putting the freezer Mm -hmm. batch in your meals getting Mm -hmm. some the people that can support you to help clean your house and do things Mm -hmm. like that get the this is where the village comes in is in that postpartum period Mm -hmm. um but you know when it comes to movement it's I also feel like you especially if you have another kid it the whole like don't move for six weeks is also a little bit silly because we are moving and we are picking things up off the ground and we are probably carrying your tumbler or especially and it's very different for everyone especially in what kind whether you had a c-section birth a traumatic birth you know it varies a lot um in your recovery so number one listening to your body is really vital in those first few weeks but there definitely is movement that you could do it might even be just on the bed initially you know doing some gentle um thread the needles on all fours or some gentle neck Mm -hmm. mobility um Mm -hmm. you know one of the things I have um our postpartum for moving mama is being released really soon and one of the things I filmed was just like a seven daily move so just movements that you can do around the bed um Mm -hmm. some point in your day and these are movements that you don't need clearance for your doctor they're just general movements that are very gentle um Mm because I think there can also be a lot of that fear about moving postpartum and we do need to because whether even if you are in everyday life, you have your pelvic floor is have to, going to have to start and cause going to have to start engaging at some point. So the earlier mm. that we can start to recruit those muscles and start to create um, 
to encourage a bit more movement back, um, especially if you're just starting your breastfeeding journey. It's a lot of being in this like reclined position, which is great for your pelvic floor because that reclined position is just going to not put pressure. But I can tell you it does not feel great on your back being in this like reclined mm-hmm. position all mm-hmm. the time. So it is important that we're also reminding it. So whether it's gentle cat cows, you know, there are things mm-hmm. you can do in that initial period. And then, of course, I really recommend, um, yeah, seeing a pelvic floor osteo or physio or someone who can. Um, I really recommend just that in, that internal assessment as well. Um, but, you know, whatever you can do to get some sort of assessment so you can gauge where you're at in your, like, specific recovery as well. Yeah, yeah, totally. I remember uh, Jenny Blath talking about doing movement quite a bit on your hands and knees just to take mm. the downward pressure off the pelvic floor and then if there's prolapse or something, obviously you're protecting that, but you're still moving and, and your belly can mm-hmm. kind of just dangle down. Um, and she had this like band, I think they have a name, but you you strap it around and it holds your like abdomen in kind of thing, like those almost like a scarf yeah. that you wrap around your lower belly. Yeah, there is like belly binding, which I'm not really a huge fan of that strong belly binding, Mm. just because I feel like if there's too much pressure in one side, like things Mm. have to go somewhere else and our organs are start having to go back to their position again. And if we're putting that strong pressure on our abdomen too soon or too strong, um, it's the same thing, you know, the pressure has to go somewhere. But I do mm. think, you know, getting a pair of supportive leggings or bike shorts or something that can just help you mm-hmm. feel that just gentle little bit of recruitment and support yeah. initially yeah. can be can be very helpful. Yeah, good to know. Yeah, I feel like I remember them being a little bit stretchy, but anyway, yeah. I can't remember what they're called. Awesome. Um, okay, cool. So what about, um, this is a little bit, uh, not unrelated, but it's a bit mm. of a sidestep just because I um just thought of uh something my friend has like often said to me because I'm a big proponent of massage and body work and also mm. movement like, you know, yoga teacher, whatever. But yeah. given that, yeah, your main jam is movement, I thought this would be interesting to ask you. And um, it's around movement versus massage. And like my friend basically doesn't buy into body work. He believes that it's for people that are just too lazy to actually move their bodies and stretch and strengthen, thus kind of replacing the need for massage. Mm-hmm. And he reckons that like a good movement and stretching session is basically like giving ourselves a massage and therefore we shouldn't need body work if we're moving properly. And, you know, he's like, well, if you're moving properly, then you shouldn't need to constantly go and get body work sessions. And these people are just going for this magic bullet and yeah. da, 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 da. <laughs> And I'm like, well, yeah, I kind of get where you're coming from, but I also fucking love massage. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there's a big place for body work as well. So I'd love totally. to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, that's such an interesting point you brought up because it's kind of my journey. I come from doing hands, I've done hands-on treatment mm. for over 15 years now and Mm -hmm. then over the last two years I've done nothing I haven't done any one-on-one specific work but the funny thing is is being online now and teaching movement I feel like almost has the same effect because we can really attach to what's going on like you can be like I'm the lower back person has the lower back pain and and I need to get that fixed every four weeks or I'm the this person and Instead of when you go to move, you just think about that thing instead of actually thinking about how can I get my whole body moving better and functioning better and moving through its full range and actually focusing on that instead of how can I get rid of the pain. And it becomes a different kind of mentality. And when you do that, generally those little niggles and things like that, when the thing areas are free around it, will free up a lot as well Mm. so I do Mm. think it it is overused I definitely feel like body work and treatment is overused in our society and a lot of time it's because we just sit too long and we're sedentary too much and Mm -hmm. that's quick it's a quick fix to feel good and we all love a quick fix of something but it's not getting to the root cause. <laughs> it's not getting to why it's there in the first place. So I feel like it can work really well in conjunction if you're or if you yeah. are daily working at the things that you need to um, move and strengthen. 
But if you're not doing those things, which I would say majority of the people who are getting hands-on treatment are, they're not doing those things anyway. They're barely doing the exercises that they're being given, let alone the general movement. Um, It's probably not. But when it comes to pregnancy and things, I think there is a lot of beneficial work with body work, though, I'm going to say, because it's not even just physical. It's your nervous mm. system, it's your lymph, uh, your lymphatic system is moving. Um, it's also that time out just for you, um, for that yeah. self care piece. And I'm really, you know, the more that you can decrease your stress, however that works, whether that's through a massage or body work, um, then I feel like that's totally. going to help you. It's going to help your baby and everything. Mm. Um, and also like we were talking a lot about balance at the start when we were talking about preparation and, you know, everything's connected. Like if you've got fascial tightness or tightness up in your neck and things, it is going to affect areas in your body. So getting that addressed, I don't think is a bad thing, but I definitely mm. think it should be your foundation. Like I don't think you should go see anyone until you're doing some daily movement until you're Mm -hmm. doing some weekly strengthening work and then going to see if you can really get that next level from from a practitioner yeah because it's it's such a common thing now to kind of outsource and want that magic bullet or that band-aid solution and just to go back every four weeks because you need to get an adjustment or you need to get cracked out and that's quite disempowering having to rely on someone else to you know fix you um quote unquote and you know it's so much more sustainable and empowering to take it into your own hands and be doing the movement stuff yourself um but yeah i i find for for like myself body work is more a nervous system yeah. thing and a relaxation thing and a pleasure thing like it feels yeah. amazing and it's just so beautiful to surrender on the table and just let someone else kind of work on my body and not have to do anything and be able to switch off and and having like massage that feels nice helps me just be so present in my body mm-hmm. and i get the kind of yeah the relaxation and and nervous system regulation benefits of that but I don't so much you know I like it so funny the people that they want a massage and they're just like go harder go harder just like really get in there and they're like wanting they want they think the harder the better and the more that's being done and the more that's being fixed um and I just don't know if that's quite as beneficial (laughs) Um, totally yeah yeah. and I just think like long term wise if you're thinking what's going to help me five years, 10 years, future me, like move better, feel better. I would be telling you to strengthen, to work on your ranges, like to do those physical things. Um, But in those moments, definitely, um, yeah, there's definitely benefit too, of course. Yeah. (laughs) Bit of, bit of column A, bit of column B. Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) Do you have a TMI story that you feel comfortable sharing? I was trying to think about this and I wanted to kind of make it relevant (laughs) to what we were chatting about um, and our topic. And I guess what the only thing that came to mind was I, because I think it's really good for people if you're going into labor and you're wanting a, especially if you're wanting a home birth and you're going to be experiencing everything yourself is to like hear stories and know what to what are the possibilities of what to expect and then it kind of normalizes it you can get over it and be like cool that that's just part of it I'm I'm willing and I'm I'm ready to move through it hey me again if you'd like to support the potty and you've already given it five stars on whatever platform you're listening on, I want to mention that you can buy some really dope merch from the website and get yourself a labia lounge tote, tea, togs. Yep, you heard that right. I even have labia lounge bathers or a cute fanny pack if that'd blow your hair back. So uh, if fashion isn't your passion, though, you can donate to my Buy Me A Coffee donation page, which is actually called Buy Me A Soy Chai Latte because... I'll be the first to admit, I'm a bit of a Melbourne cafe tosser like that. And yes, that is my coffee order. (laughs) You can do a once-off donation or an ongoing membership and sponsor me for as little as three fat ones a month. And I also have a Sunroom profile over on the Sunroom app, as I've mentioned. And I also offer one-on-one coaching and online courses that'll help you level up your sex life and relationship with yourself and others in a really big way. 
So every bit helps because it ain't cheap to put out a sweet podcast uh, into the world every week out of my own pocket. So I will be undyingly grateful if you support me and my biz financially in any of these ways. And if you like, I'll even give you a mental BJ with my mind from the lounge itself. Saucy. And, um, I'll pop the links in the show notes. Thank you. Later. Um, so <laughs> I thought I'd share Shit so myself. When- <laughs> <laughs> How did you know? That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Because when I found out that people pooed during labor, I was, it was like sex ed, I think, when I was a teenager and I was so mortified. I was like, I'm never giving birth. I don't want to shit yeah. myself in front of anyone. <laughs> I didn't know really until like I think I started listening to a few stories and then I started prepping Marty and be like, there's a good chance I'm going to poo in that bathtub, just so you know. And then I can remember that when we were in the in the bath at the very end, so we had done all the work and she was ready to push down. And when they're ready to push, you feel it in your bum. That's where you know that yep. she's coming because it's like that pressure is like it's there. And then I yep. can just remember my body just, pressed down like, and I just said the first thing I was said I was like I didn't do that that wasn't me like I because I didn't <laughs> instinctively do it like it just happened oh. and then I can look I look back and Marty and the midwife have a little um like we had a little sieve it's like a little fishing sieve got thing. a little poo scoop yeah like a kitty litter scoop. yeah and they were like they were so nice they were just they didn't even say anything they were just like scooping my poop from the water and I'm like I'm sorry <laughs> I think I was like almost crying but I was just like oh I'm God. sorry I didn't do that that wasn't me my body just did it <laughs> and then let's but like for a midwife that is an awesome sign because that means like she is coming and literally mm. I think in that next next we, there was a bit of a pause and then in that next contraction because uh, my waters didn't break so in that next contraction the sac pushed out the um the membrane and that pressure was like intense but then her head popped out and I didn't even know that I was just like what is that and the midwife was like put your hand down there and I was like what and I could just feel if you still my baby she's got a huge amount of hair and I put my hand down there and I could just feel this hair like waving in the pool. And I was oh like, oh, my, my God, God, that's her head. And then she was just like, in the next contraction, just take your time. She's going to, you're going to catch your baby. If she comes forward, you're going to pick her up. Marty, if she goes backwards, you're going to catch her and bring her through. And I'm like, okay. And then she just slid on out. So that was, I feel like the peak was probably the poo coming out. But then the next like last bit was just like amazing. <laughs> I know. Oh my god! I'm literally thing. just tearing up. I can't yeah. even hear about birth without. I know. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous how much of a miracle it is. Oh, oh! I'm exhausted. So much emotion. Also, yeah. so, I loved that story. The hair waving in the bar. Yeah. The poo scoop. We love. We love it. That was yeah. a great one. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least now other people uh, know that's going to happen. Just expect it. It's all good. It's a good sign. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, well, I reckon I'm just going to try to squeeze like one or two little tiny questions in before you have to go. Sure, if that's let's okay. do it. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious because everyone seems to have pretty conflicting opinions on this. How do you feel about Kegels or like different devices that are available to like pop up there and train your PC muscles? Mm, that's a good question. So, I mean, I think Kegels is basically your pelvic floor activation, right? It's that that ability to activate your pelvic floor, which, you know, I think if it has a place, but I think it just got overused at some point in the time mm-hmm. and some saying got told of like do your Kegels at the lights at the ca- in, in, you're in the car and things like that. But actually that's probably the worst position you could do it in because you're in that tucked under pelvis and you're not in a right. good position. So don't do that. But mm-hmm. I think it has a place, obviously, that pelvic floor activation, but it's not the whole picture. It's kind of like choosing one muscle, like if I wanted to work my bicep and I'm just going to constantly flex my bicep. But then if I then want to extend my arm to fully lengthen mine if I've only been doing kegels and only been doing these bicep flexes I'm going to lose my ability to fully lengthen that muscle so Mm. I think it has a place but I think it's just been um yeah over over pushed at some point (laughs) yeah totally I agree and something that I'll 
often explain to clients is that you know we like everyone's always wanting to have a tight pussy and uh, yeah like all of that crap um but you can have pelvic floor tension and have a tight vagina and it also be weak as fuck and cause you to pee yourself like you know a tight pussy can cause incontinence and it can cause painful sex and you know it's it's actually not good to have a tight vagina and if you have only been training it to and you know a lot of like yoga teachers and pilates teachers and stuff they've got hypertonic pelvic floors because they're constantly engaging the bundas and they're squeezing but they're not doing a lot of relaxing and releasing and, and lengthening um so do you want to just like explain that from an osteo perspective yeah I mean that's totally true because I have forgotten the statistic but I know the statistic for especially women um I don't know if it's just women especially actually but women athletes and gym goers the percentage of urinary incontinence is really high and I think Mm. that's because that inner work hasn't been adjusted. The breathing we were talking about is a huge part of the connection to your pelvic floor and your diaphragm. And so just constantly, you know, I mentioned it before of like us always sucking our bellies in to make our bellies flat. Like yeah. all those things mm-hmm. are going to create that overactivity. And a lot of the time, our, like you said, you know, your pelvic floor can be tight and weak at the same time. And yeah. You know, a lot of it can also be working on our, we want our pelvic floor to be reactive and to adaptive to what we're doing. And so working on those two elements is what's really important. Like when we go to sneeze, we want our pelvic floor to contract before. Now that's a timing issue. So you could be doing your kegels and working on that, but you're not actually addressing this timing issue that you've got with your pelvic floor. So it's very individual on what you need to address. It's not just like you've got incontinence, do your Kegels. It's just, that's just not how it's going to work. So yeah, I would say get that assessment through your pelvic floor, there's your osteo and also don't just think like, yeah, the stronger, the better, that whole like, um, I like my pelvic floor like I like my coffee or something, that meme. I don't know if you've ever seen that oh. meme come out. A lot of Pilates instructors posted of like, oh my I want my, my pelvic floor strong AF like my coffee. And it's just, it's really not helpful. <laughs> Mm, yeah. totally yeah yeah you want an articulate and toned yeah not necessarily like a tight or strong one no. yeah, yeah. <sighs> all right well this has been an enlightening conversation yeah. is there anything that we haven't covered or i haven't asked that you want to just touch upon any words of wisdom um yeah before we wrap this up around you know everything that we've spoken about with you know with i guess if you're speaking to like pregnant women or people preparing to get pregnant or give birth um what do I want to say I guess because I think a lot of listeners will be coming from different backgrounds like maybe someone's done no exercise or someone does a lot of exercise and I think what's important is that there's always something you can do so don't feel like just because you haven't exercised before there's also that sort of myth of don't start Mm. in pregnancy that it mm. might you might not be doing like full weight training but you can do body weight work you can do gentle movement mm-hmm. so there's always something you can do just and i say this as a philosophy for any of our a life students is just start where you're at that sometimes yeah. you just have to start where you're at whether that's a really regressed easy version of something um find where that is for you now and just slowly build it up from there because mm. the consistency if you is what's important and if you're in it for the long game missing a couple of weeks or because you feel sick in the first trimester don't just write it off completely just mm. get back on and just start where you're at and keep that consistent throughout because nine months yeah. later when you get to that fourth trimester that's where your body's going to be like, thank you, past Angela, for doing all that work. I appreciate you. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I would just say that start where you're at and be consistent. Yeah, great advice, baby steps. And mm-hmm. this is a good reminder to me to get back into moving <laughs> yeah. my body. I'm so lazy these <laughs> days. 
Oh, oh um, amazing. Well, I'm going to put a link to your work in the show notes and to Move and Mummers. I'm almost just chomping at the bit to go and get pregnant so that I can yes. do your course, <laughs> although I don't think my partner would be too happy about that. <laughs> um, but I'm glad to know that it's there for when it's I'm there. ready. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so our prenatal has been released um, and our postnatal is coming next month and you'll be able to either get them separate. Um, you can already get prenatal, a moving mama, but you will to also get it as a bundle as well which is cool yeah amazing fuck yeah thank you so much Angela (laughs) thanks for having me (laughs) and that's it darling hearts thank you for stopping by the labia lounge your bum groove in the couch will be right where you left it just waiting for you to sink back in for some more double l action next time and in the meantime if you'd be a dear and subscribe share this episode or leave a review on itunes then you can pat yourself on the snatch because that my dear is a downright act of sex positive feminist activism And you'd be supporting my vision to educate, empower, demystify, and destigmatize with this here podcast. Also, I'm always open to feedback, topic ideas that you'd love to hear covered, or guest suggestions. So feel free to get in touch via my website at freyograph.com or say hey over on Insta. My handle is Freya underscore graph underscore YMT and I seriously hope you're following me on there because damn, we have fun. We have fun. Anyway, later labial legends. I'll see you next time.